today is polyglot data. How many have heard of polyglot data? Not so many people. How many have heard of SQL Server? <laughs> How many think SQL Server is the best thing that you should always use on every project, no matter what the project is? <laughs> this is something I actually run into a lot with Java developers. So you go talk to a group of Java developers, you say, so, what are we going to do with this? We're going to use Oracle, we're going to use Tomcat, we're going to use JBoss, we're going to use Spring, and what are we building? A calculator. <laughs> Now when we start getting into problems, we hit huge amounts of accidental complexity because we start building using the wrong models. We're going to go through lots of examples of that today. But before we get into that, I do not mind if you interrupt me. I know Americans are known throughout the world for being the quiet types. But feel free to interrupt me if you have a question. It really will not bother me. If you actually go to Europe, there are certain groups of people that will never ask a question. So, how many have heard of some of these? React, Cassandra, Redis, they all suck, right? SQL's the way to go. <laughs> Don't even think about these guys. No, but there's lots of different choices in data storage today. You can look at column stores, you can look at graph databases, you can key value stores, you can look at document databases, you can look at object databases. Does anyone remember those? <laughs> Object databases, they're always an interesting one. But there is no best storage. There is no one storage that's going to beat every other storage in all cases. Every single storage has pros and cons to it. Even SQL has pros and cons to it. Graph databases are good at handling certain problems. Event streams are good at handling certain problems. Column databases are good at handling certain problems. Key value stores are good at certain problems. There is no best answer, they all suck. In some way, every single one of them is going to suck for you. So the real trick is, how do we start looking between them? How do we not become fanboys of MongoDB because it's web scale? Now, we mentioned object databases. Who remembers these? This was back in, what, mid-90s to early 2000s? And they were going to take over the world. How many of you use an object database today? Yeah. Now, an object database, if you hook it up behind your domain model, will be roughly one to two orders of magnitude faster for OLTP type transactions than what you're going to get from SQL. That's freaking cool. So why are they dead? I think they're going to take over the world. They really suck at doing one thing, and that's OLAP. When you start trying to do OLAP queries on them, they're awful. So what ended up happening was people would try to use them kind of the way they've been using SQL. And they say, we're going to use it as an OLTAP database. So we're going to have a third normal form that we can all of our reporting off of as well. And then they tried doing that with object databases, and they realized, well, it sucks. They start trying something, they'd be like, well, I need to load up 100,000 objects in order to do this. In SQL, I could have just done a simple group by query. I know, we'll use SQL for everything. See, it shows object databases suck. But object databases were really, really good at dealing with OLTP scenarios where you have, let's say, a domain model on top of them. Why? Because you walk links, and it supported walking links inside of the data store. And oddly, that was big O of one. I don't care what set operations you're doing, they're not going to be big O of one, and they're going to be slower. Object databases have a place. They're not going to take over the world, because what we want is we want a one-size-fits-all solution. We want the thing that sucks the least in every possible case. And we run into this stuff all the time. Now, for most applications I deal with, <coughs> using a single data model is a really bad idea. How many have a single data model today? for doing, let's say, your reporting, or your actual transaction processing, for searching. Which do you think is going to do better? SQL Server full text indexing, or Solar? Solar. Solar is a database built for doing specifically this one task. It's not something bolted onto another model. 
That said, we're going to talk about this. You always have to remember that there's a trade-off here when we talk about operational complexity and those stupid ops people that actually run your software. They, they may not like it too much when you give them 19 different solutions to run in production. Now, most of the time, you're going to find that you're going to need a minimum of three models in order to actually get your system running in a reasonable way. How many of you have an OLTP, OLAP system? Where you use one database for OLAP and <coughs> transactional behaviors. My question for you guys is always going to be the same one. What happens when Joe down the hall runs a Cartesian query in your OLAP system? And you stop accepting transactions in your transactional system? You'd be surprised how often this actually happens. Now, let's go through some problems and start seeing where accidental complexity can start coming into problem, can start coming in. Who wants to build Twitter on top of SQL Server? <laughs> well, where'd they start off with? Rails? Do you think Rails is an appropriate environment for Twitter? It's kind of a natural stream-based processing system, and eventually they, they went way far away from that. And now they're in a, a pure stream-based system. How many of you remember the fail whale? Fail whale used to come up every so often? Well, a big part of that was because they were the wrong model. They were trying to come back into relational models with stream-based information. Stream-based information doesn't necessarily work well inside of a relational model. And there are databases out there that are built specifically for processing stream information. They're called stream databases, and they offer all sorts of wonderful things, including continuous queries. Continuous query being, I write a query and it will run forever and keep telling me as the results change. Pretty cool stuff. But Twitter ran into a lot of accidental complexity because they tried to bolt their thing onto the wrong model. And getting off that model was very, very expensive for them. Luckily, they had what's called a nice problem to have. Oh no, we've got too many people using our system. We need to fix it. Oddly, we also have capital coming into our project. Let's try another one. How many of you have seen a table that looks something like this before? So we're having an ID, some data, and then a parent ID. In other words, we're making a tree inside of a table. Or perhaps it's a graph. We, we can't know which one it is just based on this. And then you make this, and everything works great and dead, and you put it out to production, and then you get a really nasty call from the administrators saying, we were profiling your queries, and um, when people try to bring up this one query, it actually takes nine minutes to run. And you go, why would it take nine minutes to run? It runs in like 500 milliseconds in dev. Well, the difference is they've got 200,000 items in this table, and there's 10 levels of depth, and you've created recursive queries. So you guys are smart developers. You come up with a really easy solution around this. So what we can do is we can have parent ID 0, parent ID 1. And this way we can do an or query against it. And we can say where parent ID 0 equals 1, or parent ID 1 equals 1, or parent ID 2 equals 1, or parent ID 3 equals 1. And then I can do the recursion in memory. And that way it will be fast. Which do you think is going to be more complicated? Dealing with this or just dealing with a graph database? What we're building up is graphs inside of SQL here. You will find no end to these kinds of situations where we are building accidental complexity into our systems because we are married to a model. And we try to force all of our problems into our solution as opposed to picking a solution for our problems. Picking the wrong model can cause a huge amount of accidental complexity in your system. I cannot even begin to tell you how much. These are just mild examples. We can get into much, much worse examples than this. How many of you have seen somebody build a key value store on top of Oracle? One of my favorite ones I see on a regular, if not daily basis. People have turned SQL Server into the world's most expensive queue. And they are inserting and then selecting on the other side and marking the thing as being read. And they're treating it as literally the world's most expensive queue, as opposed to going out and getting something like, I don't know, ActiveMQ, RabbitMQ, any of these queues that are out there. Now, fair enough, it's not always the developer's faults. 
I have worked in many, many dysfunctional organizations over the years. Many of these dysfunctional organizations would, for instance, say, well, you must do everything in Oracle because Oracle is Oracle. <laughs> so if you need a queue, you build it on top of Oracle. If you need a key value store, you build it on top of Oracle. Everything must go in Oracle because we are mildly certain that in a disaster recovery, Oracle may survive. <laughs> We've never actually tested this, but the salespeople told us. And it's impossible that anything else can have disaster recovery aside from Oracle. There are a lot of organizational problems that can lead into this as well. So it's not always the developer's fault. But very often when I go around with teams, this is where huge amounts of their accidental complexity is coming from. It's coming from them trying to jam their problem into a predefined solution as opposed to the other way around. Ah, I have been talking about event sourcing for a very long time now. My first talk, and this is actually the second one, my first talk was, I believe, in 2006 at QCon San Francisco. And it was my first big talk at present, uh, conference. I've never done one before. I like talked to user groups like around Atlanta, things like that before, but it's not quite the same as talking at QCon. To make things more fun, my talk on event sourcing was basically mixing a lot of enterprise integration patterns and messaging with domain-driven design. And no one had ever really brought them together before. Now, my front row of my talk, and I've never met any of these guys, was Eric Evans, Martin Fowler, Gregor Hope. I go in to do my talk, and I must have had about 19 cups of coffee before my talk. I managed to go through my entire talk in something like seven minutes. No, it was probably closer to 40, but it was supposed to be an hour long talk. And afterwards, Eric Evans comes to me. He's like, you know, I think I might have understood 5% of your talk which means other people probably understood less than that. But a year later, I went back and I, I did it again, and, and it, everyone said that it actually turned out pretty good. I, I wanted to get access to the video of this, but I, I have a feeling just to uh, save myself, they've actually burned it. <laughs> <laughs> but event sourcing comes in a lot when we start talking about polyglot data. As does CQRS. So command query responsibility segregation is really, really important when we start talking about polyglot data. If I go through and start looking at systems, writes are very different than reads. Now, when you're doing writes, what do you guys care about? I imagine speed, atomicity, durability. Well, yeah, that's kind of counted in durability. But you guys basically want to be able to write atomically, and you want to know that it was made durable and it's not going to get lost. What if I told you that every single database we've talked about pretty much does writes in the exact same way? Whether we talk about Neo4j, SQL Server, Oracle, SQLite, MongoDB, they all basically do writes in the exact same way. They use what's known as a write-ahead lock. Some they get a little bit more fancy. Then they use something called a log-structured merge, like SQLite and Cassandra. What they do is they write to a log. They have a transaction log they keep writing to, and then eventually that stuff gets pulled back down so that it can be read from. But the operation of the write is mostly to append something to this log. I know that sounds very complicated. You append to a log. What about when we start talking about reads? All those databases are very different for reading operations, but they're almost all identical for writing operations. Frankly, writes are freaking boring. You append to a log, call it a day. What's interesting is how you read from a database and what it, how it allows you to access your data and how it internally stores your data to represent it. Now, that and SQL and a graph database are drastically different. But in terms of writing, they're almost identical. Now, before we get more into this, reads are really important, and they're, they're off on the side. We always like to think about systems as, this is what my system does. 
what if we start splitting them based on rights and reads? And this is command query responsibility segregation. The general idea is instead of having one system, we're going to end up having two systems. One that handles all my writes, one that handles all my reads, and they're magically connected somehow in the middle, and they're probably eventually consistent between the two. How many of you have at least one order of magnitude more reads than you do writes? It's pretty normal, actually. Think about the Guardian. How many writes do you think they do for every one read? Okay, we could be in try the New York Times, oh wait, they're down right now. <laughs> when we talk about reads, reads are generally where scalability problems happen. It's not rights. Unless you happen to be in one of the really cool domains like finance or gambling, in which case rights happen to be the, the main thing that's going on. What about rights that require reads for integrity? We'll get into this. In general, going through our reads for our scaling problems, not our rights. Now, just to give a brief overview of CQRS for people that are maybe not familiar with it. CQRS, we originally called CQS, which is Command and Query Separation. This is an old pattern by a guy named Bertrand Myers. Anyone heard of him? Okay, if you've never heard of him, when you get out of this class, out of this, go outside where you have internet, Google his name, or, or go look on Amazon. He has a book on object orientation. Buy it. You'll thank me for it later. But buy the second edition, not the third. Uh, Bertrand, B-E-R, T-R-A-N-D, Meyer, M-E-Y-E-R. The second edition is the one that you want to get. His book is a pen only. And I think it, from the second edition to the third edition, it gained about 500 pages. So either get the second edition or cancel your gym membership. But what the basic idea said was, commands have a void return type. And they're allowed to be dead state. Really simple idea. Queries have a non-void return type, and they are not allowed to mutate state. In a functional world, they would be called pure functions. Now, that's quite useful to do in your code because you can start rationalizing, rationalizing about things. Like for instance, if I'm if I'm asking you for information, I can ask you for it as many times as I want, and it won't change. Providing I haven't done anything else, I can just keep asking you for the same information over and over again, and you will not have side effects. A void indicates that you may have side effects. Think about it in terms of rationalizing multi-threaded code as an example. Where this actually comes from is from Eiffel, the language that he created. Eiffel is what's known as a design by contract language. And it's very common that you would want to use queries inside of your contracts. Like, I require q.count to be greater than zero. Now, if you really, really screwed up me checking that q.count was greater than zero, subtracted the item from the queue. What happens if I don't run that check at runtime? I get different behavior because of what the compiler does in my contracts? That'd be crazy. So when we start talking about things like contracts, you need to be able to support things like pure functions. If you go even further, what he's really doing is he's slowly pushing you to functional code. And one day you're going to get told, by the way, there are no such things as commands. Everything is query. And you just need to figure out how to make that work. And now, welcome to Haskell. <laughs> CQRS, we originally called CQRS. We use the same definition of commands and queries. The major difference between what we were doing and what Bertrand Meyer was doing was we said we're going to break them apart and put them on two objects. So you have one object with a bunch of commands and a bunch of queries. We go, no, 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 that's two objects. One object with all the commands, the other object with all the queries. And there's some reasons we want to do this when we start getting onto higher level architectural viewpoints. And it's generally because we want to make different decisions <coughs> about how we handle things when we're reading versus how we're handling things when we're writing. They're different. They're different problems. Trying to find the solution that sucks the least on both of those problems doesn't turn out very well. How many of you guys feel like all day all you deal with is trade-offs? How many of you have something around a third minus normal form database? 
Oh, wait. Oh, wait, yeah, something like that. <laughs> exactly that. Being able to specialize them separately allows me to do a lot of really, really interesting things. Like, for instance, to write domain models with no getters on them. That's a cool trick. But it also allows me to do things like query directly to a database and just produce DTOs as opposed to querying through a domain model. How many of you have queried through a domain model before? Maybe it hibernate behind it? Um, I've always likened it to be something along the lines of trying to write Shakespeare by typing Swedish into Google Translate. <laughs> Getting hibernate to produce what I want on the other side is quite the feat at times. Well, really, how many of you guys have been given a query by your DBA? I want you to run this query. Now, all you have to do is get Hibernate to produce it. By the way, it's got four unions inside of it. It should be fun. Now, when we talk about commands, commands are writing. We said earlier, almost every database on the planet uses an appending log. It's a well-known pattern. If you want to learn more about it, try Googling log structured merge or transaction file. If you guys use SQL Server, SQL Server has a transaction file, oddly. It's actually a well-known pattern. This is not something that they came up with. It's something that's been around for decades. How many of you remember building systems before SQL was really popular? Maybe back in mainframe days? Let me guess, you probably wrote your own appending file. And then you would have chasers going on the appending file to do things like update shared memory, and then you query off the shared memory to get the information. This is how people were doing stuff before things like SQL became really, really popular. There's a reason for that. Appending events, records, to a log file is about as perfect of a model as you can get for transactional behaviors. Now, given it's a little bit more complicated than that, you have to talk about prepares versus commits, or perhaps prepare commit and how to keep things in sync and how to deal with your locking, but it's not that hard. Most people can grasp it if they wanted to. Storing of events, these appending events, is also known as event sourcing. My only model that I store is all the events that I've previously done before. If I want to get back my current state, I replay my events. Or maybe I keep my state in memory. And I only use it to replay if I have to because I've lost memory. Append only is great. How many of you have bought a hard drive? Have you ever looked on the side of the hard drive? They give you two speeds for everything. One of them is random. The other one is sequential. If I'm in an append only model, which one am I doing? Sequential. And that tends to be a little bit faster, especially with spindle drives, because the head's not moving anymore. There's some other cool things you can do with it. You could, for instance, put it on a worm drive. A worm drive is a write once, read many drive. Um, it's a drive you can physically only write once, and that way you have a, a log that will pass most regulatory systems. You physically cannot rewrite the disk, so what's on the disk is good. And you know it hasn't been changed. There's another thing that comes along with this, and that's that they're immutable. How many have heard that mutable state is evil? Immutable stuff is awesome. Well, let's just think for a minute. Let's imagine I am going to put out a stream of events to all you guys, and my events are mutable. They can be changed. Every once in a while, he may want to change one of the events. What would I set my HTTP caching on them to? None. What if they're immutable? What would I set my HTTP caching to? End of time. Forever. Just keep them. So if you want to like replay that stream, you're going to replay it off your hard drive and never even talk to me. I don't have to worry about synchronization when it comes to immutable data. It's a really, really nice model for dealing with lossless transactions. Just keep appending events. And there's a lot of databases out there that already do it. Um, oddly, many of them are built on top of other databases that do it again. Like, for instance, you can get a system that will append events to a SQL table that appends events to a transaction table in order to do that. Cool. Let's see how many levels of indirection we can get, because that always makes everything better, right? Just add another layer of abstraction. And by the way, normally they're run on a file system that is also a journaling file system. <laughs> how many journals do we need? Now, there's lots of different kinds of separation that we can talk about. Reads and writes are one of the main ones that I've been talking about for a couple of years. 
It's an important one. Because you really have different needs for the writes of your system than for your reads. I'd be willing to bet you that for probably everybody except for one or two people in this room, I could run your writes on a Raspberry Pi and it would keep up with your system. How many have more than 10 writes per second? Two. Okay, on a Raspberry Pi, I got up to about 1,200. There's not that many people that are doing that. Reads, however, I don't think I could do most of your systems on a Raspberry Pi. It's going to be too heavy. There's too much reads going on. Reads are generally where our load is. Writes are very simple. But we have other kinds of separation. Time is a big form of separation. This is a beautiful example of a multivariate problem. When we start looking at varying kinds of read models, there's lots of things we can start looking at. When I'm in a problem like this, there's some tools I can use that work really, really, really well. How many have heard of a tool called Cassandra or a tool called Neo4j? Neo4j is a graph database. Now, if you happen to run into a multi-pirate problem, it works really, really, really well. When I was with a company, and they were dealing with this, and time is a really, really important concept when you start talking about separation. So they had one of these, these big multivariate problems. What they were doing is they were putting it into HBase, or sorry, Hadoop. And once per month, they would run this massive query across billions of records. It would take 100 least servers a day to come up with the answer for it. But data once a month isn't really a good idea, is it? Would your business like to receive the core information about their business once per month? Or maybe they want to get it a little bit more frequently than that so they can start doing things like, well, I try to tweak this. Think about the feedback cycle if you're trying to tweak something and you can only get the data once per month coming back out. So there's lots of things we can start doing when we start talking about separation. What if you were to use two solutions on this problem? What if I were to, for instance, use a stream database for real-time processing and something like Hadoop for giant map reduces. So what if I were to do my giant map reduce and then my stream database were to sit on top and it were to look for interesting places that I think we've changed from what my map reduce said. And then it could run little map reduces based on what it's detecting in real time. It wouldn't do the whole data set again. They just do one particular area. This is a very common solution where we'll end up using multiple tools. We will have something that works now, and we'll have something that works big. I can't make big happen right now, but I can start trying to invalidate parts of big to be able to make small incremental things. As an example, if I were going to be, I don't know, counting cars that were going through various intersections, I have some prediction over what's going to be happening. If right now I'm counting and I get completely out of whack, this one's had 10 times as many as I thought it would be. I take that information, immediately put it up, and I feed it back into my larger algorithm. <coughs> one way of thinking about this is the fast and the big. Now you will not be able to do this kind of massive multivariate problem in real time. It's just, you're not gonna be able to do it. Too much work. But you can find places inside of the problem that need to be redone or have indicators that maybe your information is going bad. And then put that information in and run small parts of the problem again. This is a quintessential use of two systems in terms of polyglot data. Instead of only looking polyglot reads versus writes, I'm going to look at things in terms of temporality. We've got one that's running fast and one that's running big. There's lots of these different kinds of separation that you can actually run into, where you may want to use more than one tool. Other ones of these. 
when we start dealing with streams of information. How many of you guys have dealt with streams before? Some stuff's happening in the real world and you need to find out something about what's going on in the real world. There's one model which is particularly good at dealing with what we might call temporal correlation queries. Now let me give an example of a temporal correlation query for you. How many of you have ever talked with a, like, or a doctor or a researcher in the medical industries? They've got this one really big problem they have to deal with. Um, it's finding patients for clinical data trials. So we've got 300 million patients in America, and what I'm looking for are ones that were diagnosed with this type of cancer within the last two years. They had to have been given treatment one within six weeks of their diagnosis, not have condition C, let's say diabetes, and within two months of starting that treatment, they had to fail with a lab result that looked like this. Maybe their white blood cells weren't responding with the treatment, they are getting some side effect. Then, within four months, they had to be put on this other treatment. And this other treatment, it had to run for less than two months, and it had to fail with this kind of lab result. Who wants to write this query for me in SQL? It'll be fun. <laughs> so we're going to start off with a table with four billion rows in it. And then what we're going to do is we're going to do nested subqueries inside of this. I'm sure indexing will solve all your problems. <laughs> it's not the right model for trying to handle this particular problem. Stream databases are perfect for this problem. And they can also continue running after you're done. So I go through and I'm putting in my query and I say, cool, and I get up my list of patients. I say, by the way, could you uh, let Feedly know anytime a new patient comes in? I check my blogs every morning and all of a sudden patients start showing up as they meet my criteria. This is now a continuous query. There are lots and lots of examples like this where we're dealing with interesting problems that may not necessarily fit well into standardized solutions. Oh, that's nice. That seems to have lost my slide. Brilliant. Where are the rest of my slides? I wouldn't go past that one. Cool. No, no I don't want to broadcast it. Thank you. I wonder if it'll get stuck on the same page. Oh, there it goes. Oh, it sucks. It's actually my diagrams for apparently those two white and Slides, so it'll be a little bit more difficult to explain things without my diagrams there. We've mentioned that storing events is a great transactional model. Now I'll tell you guys another secret. Even with all these different forms of separation that we're talking about, when you start looking at polyglot data, the only place you care about it is reads. You don't care about it for reads. You care about it when you're reading information. I don't care whether I'm writing to a graph database or a SQL database until I actually start querying. They both have the equivalent of insert into. It doesn't really make a difference which database you write to. It's the model that stores your data and how it's going to give it back to you for reads that's really, really, really important. So if we're following CQRS, why don't we just use an appending log for writes and instead of having one read model, the way most people tend to do, why not have five read models? Why not have a key value store, Lucene, SQL, well, we'll make some OLAP cubes, and we'll make the graph inside of Neo4j. How many have used multiple databases like that before? Wait for a few people to raise their hand, and I, I know there's a question here, it's just the quiet Americans won't ask it. Americans are known for their subtlety. Well, how do I keep my data in sync between all of them? When I've got four databases that I'm querying from, they go out of sync with each other because they're not the same database. 
And then what? Then my users get really, really confused. And eventually I just go, this data is complete garbage, and I start throwing them away, and then we rebuild the entire project to become Oracle. <laughs> <laughs> that way it'll be consistent. Now, without the diagram, it's actually a lot harder to see. It actually kind of sucks. The general idea here is if I am writing to a queue on my right side, a read side can come and ask me for all the events that have happened in the system. It can come and ask me, starting from event zero, I want to go back in time to the very beginning of time and play forward. Now, we put here that we have an infinite history. There's no such thing as an infinite history. There's only so many hard drives on the planet. However, we imagine that we are going to store your entire history. For most systems, this is actually feasible. How many of you have more than 100 gigabytes of data today? Actually, quite a few. Five terabytes. Well, that weeded out most of them. 20 terabytes. Okay, that's right on the edge. Even at 20 terabytes, for me to store, all of that is not that expensive of a proposition. Now, I would not recommend doing this with SQL Server by putting, you know, 52 terabyte drives inside of your server, <laughs> rating them up and pointing to SQL at um, This is probably not the most affordable option that you could be taking. For instance, you should be better off partitioning them, sharding them across multiple servers. But in my read models, are going to be coming up and reading off of my event stream that I'm storing. I've been storing this event stream over time. What are my read models at that point? Caches. Nothing more. Are you guys afraid to drop a cache? I'm not afraid to drop a read model. I've gone in and done drop database on a read model before. I'm not scared. I can rebuild it. At any point in time, I can just replay all of my event handlers, the sync of the events, and it'll make me a new remodel. In fact, what we're doing is very similar to what's happening inside of databases. Except databases normally give you one choice, right? How do you get a SQL Server to store all your information as a graph, as opposed to in a relational way? But internally, SQL Server has a transaction file. Yes? What we're doing is we're saying we're going to make the transaction file separate. Our right side is writing to a transaction file. And we can have as many readers as we want off that transaction file to as many different models as we want. Because that's where we care about things, is on reads. I can have one going to Neo4j, I can have one going to MongoDB, I can have one going over to an OLAP queue. I don't run into problems with synchronization. And the reason I don't end up with problems with synchronization is because I have this whole stream of events. I can always go back in time and replay them again. All of my read models are simply caches. They're caches in different formats. <coughs> hmm? What about for scalability? Could I put 15 SQL servers next to each other, all running the same projections into, the, into them? Multiplex my queue of events 15 times? Easily. I basically have a log of events. I can have 15 different servers looking at that and all having the exact same way of looking at it. I could then, for instance, geographically distribute them. That should be really easy. I just take the servers and put them in different places. And okay, instead of serving it uh, over something like TCP, I might want to use something like an HTTP in order to be able to deliver them. This is generally where people start going when they start getting into polyglot data. They start realizing that polyglot data is important on your reads, not on your writes. Writing, all of the databases basically do the exact same thing. It's the reading part that's interesting. And for most systems, we're going to want to use more than one form of reading. And this is really where event sourcing comes in. Only store events of your system. 
then let all the other models decide what the events mean to them. What happens if you have a bug in your code that's actually hooking up Neo4j? I know you guys wouldn't write bugs, but maybe you have some juniors that work on your team. And what would happen? We have a bug in how we're updating Neo4j. Fix it, drop your entire Neo4j model, and replay. That will not only fix it now, it will fix it for all of history. Now, people get really worried when I say that. They go, but we're in production. We can't just drop a database for a day. OK, so don't drop it for a day. Leave the old one running. Bring up a new one, start it from zero. Once it's caught up, then drop the old one and switch them. Uh, well, generally, you can't join between multiple. Um, what you're going to end up doing a lot of, um, the quintessential example is would be Lucene and a key value store. So what I'm going to be putting into Lucene is going to come back with links that I can identify back over to a key value store. Um, generally, I will not be able to, let's say, do a SQL join between them because mo uh, most of them won't support like a linked server protocol because they don't have a concept of tables. And if I don't have a concept of tables, what are you joining to? That's actually interesting. What we generally do is we're going to end up with links that go back and forth between them. Um, another perfect example of this would be using a graph database. So I want to use a graph database to look at, we're a large company. I want to look at the relationships between our employees from an HR perspective where they've worked before, who they've worked with. I'm trying to identify hubs inside of our organization because hubs are interesting people to know, especially if they're not already promoted. I'm not going to put all of the employee information in there with that. I'm going to end up putting a link that's going to go back to a key value store which is going to hold all the employee information. Um, links are the most common way that we're going to integrate between these things. That doesn't necessarily mean that our links are going to have to be bookmarked. It doesn't mean, for instance, I'm going to put in an actual link from the key value store. What I may be doing is I may just be putting in an ID and a little layer on top, I'll actually give, I'll translate what that link should be. I may not actually store it inside of the database. Does that make sense? But again, this infinite queue and my ability to replay off of it is what allows me to keep all of my various models in sync with each other. All of my models will be updating in near real time. I can make them consistent if I want to, but I would not recommend it. You're better off having your models be 500 milliseconds to a second eventually consistent than trying to do consistent updates across all of them. Why? Synchronization locking. Synchronization locking, and my personal favorite is, what happens when you're upgrading one of them? <laughs> oh wait, now you can do nothing. Cool. I think you'd rather have that one fall behind while you're upgrading it than to be able to say nobody is allowed to write to the system right now. Sorry, we'll let you know when the database comes back up. Now, there's lots of different ways we can start looking at this. Here we have a client writing back to a domain with Hibernate. <laughs> at some point, we end up with events. And the events are getting pushed over to an OLAP system, to a graph database, and to a stream processing engine. Now, you're going to run into some problems here if you're using Hibernate and a system of events. Um, it will not play well together. How many of you have had a domain model that started raising events to other systems before and was saved with Hibernate? I see this one on slides all the time talking about CQRS-based systems. And my question to them is always, have you used this in production? That system is guaranteed to basically have problems in production. The reason why is because you have an opportunity here to have two things go out of sync with each other. You have two sources of truth. One is Hibernate. The other one is your event stream. How do you prove that what Hibernate found as changes inside of your domain objects 
has a quality with what you found in events. What if you can't prove this? What if there's a bug? Well, then your models are going to go a little bit out of sync. Now, you'll never find this problem in staging or dev. How often do you guys delete dev or set it to some known starting point? What about production? How often do you truncate production to some known starting point? <laughs> so in production, they're just going to keep diverging further and further apart from each other, whereas in dev, you're going to keep resetting them back. So they're never going to diverge that far. But here's our general idea of what we're going to be looking at. Our client is going to be writing up. At some point, we're going to write down events. These are all chasers off of those streams. And we can have as many of those as we want. Some of them may be structural models. Other of them may be things like stream processing models. Some of them may work in memory. One of my favorite one of these models to do is to put all of your data in memory. Why not? I bet a lot of you have a service or two that has less than a gigabyte of data. Why am I going to go read it off a disk? Or even make a call out of a process to get your data? I'm just going to put it all in memory in your process and just start serving it from there. If I lose it, well then I just have to replay it when I start up again. I'm going to start replaying the events back into memory, changing memory to the point where I'm caught up. I can even put in snapshotting. So let's say you've got 5 million events, you don't want to replay all of them. So every million events, I'm just going to write down what the model actually was in memory at one million events. Then I only have to replay from that point forward. Of course, I run into a problem if I change my in-memory representation. I still have to go all the way back to the beginning and play the ball. But this is generally what people are setting up when they're starting to look at polyglot data. They're going to have one write model and many, many, many read models. Now, the old app is actually one of my favorite ones to put there. How many of you guys have business experts that like Excel? <laughs> my favorite ad hoc reporting solution. Here's a star schema and Excel. Have a nice day. We'll talk to you in a month. If you want any customized reports on that, show me the Excel sheets, and we'll, we'll make them into customized reports based on that. But if you have people that know how to do it, it's actually a very, very powerful combination. There's lots of differences between all of these different kinds of models and what they're capable of doing. They all solve very, very niche problems. We have a tendency, and this is largely because of our vendors, of wanting to choose one tool. And that one tool, the vendors will try to make it do everything poorly. Well, Look at SQL Message Broker, full text searching, Oracle being able to query with X paths of JSON. Really? That's part of the relational model? I, I must have missed that part of the relational algebra. There's loads of these examples where they're building in and bolting on this functionality so that you only have to use this one tool. <clears throat> in almost all these cases, though, you'll find that, that tool actually sucks at what it does compared to the tools that are built specifically for it. It's a bullpark tool. Now, if you're in a place where you're working with a gigabyte of data, it probably doesn't make a difference. But as you start getting bigger and bigger data sets, it makes a huge difference. Getting things into the right model, you can start looking at dropping the things that you're using from very large machines to very, very small machines. Years ago, we had an algorithmic trading system. And we were doing some very unusual things, like, for instance, event sourcing inside of it. And our business side said, well, you guys are doing some really weird things. We want to bring in guys like Oracle and Microsoft to find out what the industry standard way of doing this would be. And it's funny, because they, they Oracle did a really good presentation. And they, they were really, really, they were great until it came time to talk money. And they actually had an expert application for how to best screw you over. <laughs> so it's like they can't actually talk about prices from a sales perspective. They need to type them into this, the expert system. And the expert system will tell them how they should position themselves in terms of how to price it. It's like, really? That's brilliant. Now, Microsoft came in as well. And they, they actually did a very good presentation as well. 
And everything went well until they basically told us the hardware that they thought we should be running. They thought we should run two HP domes. Uh, keep in mind, this is like seven, eight years ago. An HP dome is 64 IE64s with half a terabyte of memory. Not to mention all of the fancy disks that are built in. They cost roughly equivalent to two to three houses each. And by the way, you need two of them for availability purposes. <laughs> At the time, we were running on a quad CM. Two-year-old server. The difference was we chose a different model to run it. Uh, we were running in a pure event source model with, with streaming on top of it. And for stock market analytics, it's actually a really good model to be running in, not dealing with a relational model. But keep in mind that you can end up with huge costs, both in terms of physical costs, as well as complexity, based on choosing the wrong model when you start looking at a lot of these problems. Don't constrain yourself to fitting your problem into a pre-existing solution. Try doing it in other solutions. Try picking a solution for your problem. Not that we already had that one. But in general, the wrong model can cause huge amounts of accidental complexity. Um, I can't even begin to get into how many times I've seen in systems. All their complications that they have came from the fact that they chose the wrong model. If they had chosen a different model to represent their problem in, their problem would have been trivial. The largest one I see this with, well, actually, I guess there's two or three. Uh, the, the few I see today that are the largest for this is people not understanding what a graph database is. Graph databases get re-implemented left and right. If you have one thing that you should learn, try graph databases. It's a really, really useful model, not only for things like social networking problems. There's a whole other slew of problems that work well in it. If I remember right, there's actually a talk on one of them tomorrow morning. Um, I, I can't speak for the quality of the talk. I just happened to see there was a graph database talk. That was during my you know, 15 seconds before I started my presentation. The next one I see a lot of, and I see this very, very often, is people reinventing messaging systems inside of SQL databases where they start querying tables with status flags to figure out, like basically it's a queue. And they use it from different areas and you're much, much better off to actually understand messaging and use queues for this than to try to get SQL to do. Um, how many of you can get SQL up to 20,000 inserts per second? No? It's relatively trivial to do in a queue. But you need a really, really big SQL server in order to do that. Why? Because it's doing a whole bunch of other stuff on top of it as well. This choosing the wrong model can cost us a lot. Understand many different models. Understand their pros and their cons. Overall, when we talk about rights, rights, store events, it's your best model for most systems. Most systems are better off just storing events than storing any kind of third normal form relational model. Why? Because when you're writing, what you care about is making data durable. And that's what your system's already doing. If you're using a third normal form model, it does that first and then gives it to you in a third normal form model. You can still put it in a third normal form model afterwards. Just do the one right, and then query up the third normal form model if you want to. But storing things as a series of events will make a lot of these kinds of systems simpler. When we talk about different forms of separation, reads and writes are one form of separation. Remember that while writes we tend to prefer appending of events, when we talk about reads, that's where all these other models become really, really important when people talk about polyglot data. The single worst thing that you can do is to try to attempt polyglot data by saying, okay, what we're gonna do is we're gonna bring in Cassandra, Mongo, and Neo, and we're gonna write to all of them and read from all of them. And then all your data goes completely out of sync with everything, and you're like, well, crap. See, polyglot data is a failure. <laughs> no, you're a failure, there's a difference. <laughs> <laughs> if you try that, you're going to run into problems, because you're not gonna end up writing the same thing to all of them. You're gonna end up with multiple sources of truth. What is your book of record at that point? If you're going through and you're following and you're writing 
streams of events, and then from the streams of events, you're updating all of these different read models. What is your book of record? It's the stream of events. It's a single source of truth. Don't write to multiple sources of truth. Keep it to one, and then let that one fan out to the other so they can update the different read models. And there's one thing I really, really want everybody to leave from this talk with. It's the idea that there is no such thing as a best storage. All of them suck. They all suck in their own unique ways. There isn't one storage system that's going to be the best for every problem. To come in and say, well, we use SQL Server on every single problem that we attack, is like saying that I use a bulldozer for every time I need to dig dirt, whether it's your garden or a swimming pool. Or for me to say, well, every time I dig dirt, I use a little tiny spade, regardless of if I'm going to be digging your, spit, your, your garden or your swimming pool. There is no best answer to all of these questions. There are, there are many different variables that come into play. Certain models are going to be good at some things and terrible at other things. Remember what happened to object databases. It's not because object databases sucked, well actually they do, but they suck in their own unique way. It's because people were using them for things that they were not designed for. And it's a lot of the same complaints people end up having with SQL databases. They start using them for things they were never designed to be used for. Same thing people start complaining about document databases when I try to treat them like they're SQL. And I put a row per document and then somehow it doesn't work well when I start trying to join everything together. Well, that's not how they were intended to be used. Understand each of them, their pros and their cons. Every single one of them has situations that's going to be good. And SQL is actually good in a huge number of scenarios. Now everybody talks about NoSQL and how it's the future. No, relational databases are freaking awesome in a lot of problems. They're also terrible in some problems, which is why you have a bunch of competitors that are coming in. But there is no best storage system for all of your problems. Picking one, it's just irresponsible. You almost always want to be looking at multiple of them. Now, with that, since you guys haven't asked lots of questions, I will give you the opportunity now to ask questions, since apparently you didn't feel like interrupting me except for one other score. <laughs> So I think it depends on the enterprise. Um, just recently I was dealing with a company that, I can't even pretend business or but they have 1,500 deployments and very hard to reach places. And for them, they actually have a rule that operationally you are only ever allowed to use SQL Server, any of them, for any purpose of data storage. The reason why? A rollout for them is a freaking nightmare. Uh, it, just imagine you have to go upgrade 1,500 remote sites. They don't even have a technician on every single site, but they need to actually be able to upgrade them. Uh, for them, operational complexity is so high that they, they are just paranoid about putting anything out there. Um, even if you start talking about things like, I want to use memcached in process. No, 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 that sounds like a database. We're afraid of that. But it's going to be in memory. No, 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 it sounds like a database. Do it and see. Um, other organizations I found are a lot more open to it. Um, there's also a large overlap between organizations that are interested in things like functional code versus organizations that are willing to start looking at different data solutions. The other organizations that tend to be very interested in looking at, data, at different data solutions are the ones that actually have hard problems. Um, the ones that are sitting there and they've just got 200 different enterprise cookie cutter solutions line of business apps, they don't really care because it's not worth their time to even look at. Um, each one of them has 500 megs to a gigabyte of data, and whether you use a really terrible solution or a good solution, they could probably still be running on access and they would be okay. Once they start getting bigger problems though, they start realizing the massive operational cost from having the wrong level. Um, for instance, they start realizing that buying bigger and bigger servers to run SQL 
uh, relational databases on them, it doesn't scale well past a certain point. It starts going exponential. Um, you start saying, well, we need to get a, a new one of these servers, and it's going to be $1.7 million. <laughs> and they start looking at things like partitioning out and using something like a key value store or REOC, um, something like MapReduce instead. But overall, I'd say you're going to find it to be very, very mixed in terms of enterprise space. Um, as with most things, you will see it starting off in the startup groups. The next, the next step is going to probably be small to medium. Then you're going to start getting the small and medium vendors that are really starting to push on it. And eventually, it's going to go all the way up. That said, if you go to a financial client, you will probably see tons of this stuff. Uh, they tend to be much more leading edge than other companies. Uh, so it's really going to depend on industry, deployment scenarios, um, let's call it a risk adversity of the organization. Um, and there's no simple answer to whether or not it's going to be picked up by them. So I imagine a situation where you want to boot back up one of your subscribers and there's three years of data and 300 million events and it takes five days for it to come back to consistency. Yep. How do you mitigate that? So normally I'll run more than one of them. So that's going to be happening asynchronously. It's joining up. It's going to take load off. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I can do is, um, just like uh, with your with a SQL database, you can take a backup at various points in time and just remember where you were at the point of the backup in the transaction log and reapply a transaction log for it. I can do the same thing with remodels. So take the backup based on like the transaction ID, the left, like the ID you stopped at to do it, yeah. and then do a diff kind of from that. Yeah, exactly. Cool. That's like a million row ID idea. Every million rows. You yeah, exactly. Out. Every one million rows, I'm just going to remember at this point, snapshot down. Where this where this will give me a hard time, though, is if I want to change how I'm actually writing to that thing. So if I'm changing what I was actually writing in the Neo, I'm writing a completely different graph now. It doesn't help me. I'm going to need to replay. But I want to make sure I can do that asynchronously. Um, so let's say I'm, I'm making this new thing for a feature that we're going to be releasing. Well, part of my release is I'm going to, I'm going to build up that entire model before I release. If that takes over the weekend, so be it. Uh, sometimes it will. There's nothing you can do about it. Thanks. The one other thing that you can do, uh, generally data, once it reaches a certain age, you may not care about it anymore. Or you may have a varying, uh, let's call it stopping points from a business perspective. Accounting would be a perfect example of this. Um, at the end of the financial year, I take all the accounts from last year move over the balance into a new account for this year and continue forward. So I may not, I may be able to partition up that problem so I don't have to go through all 300 million. Okay. You're saying that uh, the writes are boring and reads are where all the action is because that's where the models come out. And you mentioned earlier about having uh, an issue with bugs and then you would just go and redo your reads. How often in your experience uh, is the bug in the write? Oh, quite often, and that's where we get into some fun, because in an append-only model, I can't just go back and say that never happened. I have to put in a new fact to say that fact was actually a bug, and here's a correction. Um, I've got a talk I've done it quite a bit of. I've been sourcing that goes into that. Um, if you look up an unleash your domain, there's a fairly long conversation about that. Because um, I also need to let all my subscribers know, by the way, that was a bug back there. Um, it can also get you into an interesting concept of as of versus as at queries, depending on what domain you happen to be in. So, what suggestion do you have for the ERP system here being on forced to pay for database? So, if you are forced to a particular database, and you want to get out of being forced to a particular database, um, well, if there's an old expression about how you can change your surroundings or you can change your surroundings. Mm -hmm. um, well, no, at the end of the day, it's going to be true. I mean, if you have people on top of you that are making completely, totally irrational decisions that you disagree with, at some point, you may want to move to a different team. Um, that said, there are some perfectly valid reasons for wanting to only use a single data store. Um, operational complexity is a perfect example of this. Now, what I would be looking for is, is this something that we're having a rational conversation about? Or is this something that we're having a religious conversation about? Um, is it we're having a conversation and they're saying, well, we've looked at this, we understand, we're concerned about operational complexity, 
We've done some spikes. We've sat with the admins to see how they feel about actually being able to run this stuff in production. And that's where we started getting our issues. Or is it something that never even got a start and you weren't even able to get past that first point? If you're in the, the latter, that's probably a bad situation. It's probably not only that one problem. There's probably quite a few other similar situations. Um, where, for instance, you might be able to say, like, oh, this new thing that we're looking at, yeah, I could do it in four lines of F sharp code, and you're talking about writing 30,000 lines of C sharp code. But we need for a C sharp shop, of course, we're going to write C sharp. Um, and at some point, there's nothing that you can do, but uh, I would be really interested, and we can talk about it after if you want, about where that conversation started from and whether it was rational or irrational. So, you guys are work with, um, you've seen basically relational databases. One of the challenges we run into is really very similar, but more evolutionary. We have a company that might be interested in considering Polyglot or moving into an event forcing mindset. You know, it feels fairly disruptive, maybe consistent with OOP, but not necessarily consistent with the new kind of design. How would you recommend maybe introducing them into the mindset without completely changing their world? It's because object identity here feels like it's a kind of a subject, right? Oh, no, no, no. It, there was actually a great quote from Eric Evans recently. that said, you know, he's starting to realize that looking at domain models as streams of events actually makes much crisper models. Um, it's completely 100% in line with DB. Um, and it's not just object orientation that's in line with it's even more in line with functional code. Um, Basically, we can say at the end of the day, the current state is a left fold of previous history. Um, I don't think you'll completely blow them away if you introduce them to event sourcing. Um, it's a relatively painless move. Um, we can talk afterwards if you want about some strategies that I use uh, in terms of moving people from an actual object mindset to basically having that object coming back down and being sourced from events. Um, it's not a huge jump one way or the other. It's I'd say three lines of code refactored. And when they see it as three lines of code refactored, they go, ah, okay, I get it. So let's say you have an existing data model now, an existing relational data model, and you want to go to an event source data model, then is that your first snapshot? Uh, so normally you would not move all at once. You're going to take little bite-sized pieces, and you're going to move over bite-sized pieces one at a time. When you do that, you're going to end up with two strategies for migrating a brownfield, uh, brownfield project with an existing data model into event source. And you're probably going to end up using a, a combination of both strategies. The first one is an initialized event. So here's the state of this thing at the time that we're going to start event sourcing it. Initialized. Sometimes, however, I may be able to look back in that other model and I may be able to start pulling out some history of it. And I may be able to create a history of events based on the stuff I can read out of it that will actually port it over. An accounting system would be a perfect example of this. I can read through the transaction log and I can build out all the events from the transaction log because they're a form of serialized events. And in most systems, I can figure out at least some of the events involved with something and bring them over. And if I can figure out whether or not it's worthwhile it depends on the object. Um, overall, you're going to end up using both strategies. Um, if I, as I'm moving over different pieces, I will choose some mixture of the strategies between them. Um, it may even be I take over an initialized event, and I also take over some of the history before that, just so that I have the history brought over. Um, it's roughly equivalent to if you've ever done a migration on an accounting system. So we have an accounting system from last year. We're bringing in Great Plains this year. We had I don't know, something else last year. Do we just bring over the balances of all the accounts to start with, or do we try to migrate the history out of the old system into the new system so we can query off? Um, which one you choose depends on your scenario. What do you just up with uh, an over-integrated system, and is it a good idea or a bad idea to try to recreate an event stream on that to you know, bring it into your other applications that are going to be true for that stream? That's very context dependent. Um, <laughs> As we were just saying, you're, you're going to use some amount of uh, dealing with things that what's the value of the data inside of the thing? How antiquated is it? What options do I have for being able to get in at that data? 
Um, will I actually be able to gain intent out of that data, or am I just going to get CRUD events? Um, do I have a data analytics team that I can go, hey guys, you're really good at reverse engineering events from snapshots. Can you go in and do that for me? Um, there, there's a whole lot of questions that come up. In what kind of domain does this suck? Does one suck? <laughs> this this structure of event based. Ah, that, 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 that's actually a really really useful one. If your domain has four verbs in it, it sucks. <laughs> If the verbs in your domain are create, read, update, and delete, and that is how your business users view your system. They view your system as being as sets of linked spreadsheets, then it will absolutely totally suck. Uh, you will find yourself spending a lot more time and effort on things that you should have just done with uh, some crappy scaffolding on top of the database. And don't be wrong, that's actually a significant portion of systems out there. Um, when people start talking about event sourcing, one of the biggest problems I find is they, they find it, they go, oh, I'm going to apply it everywhere, it's great everywhere. No, you should only be applying this stuff in areas where it's probably going to be at the core of your business. Maybe one or two contexts at most inside of your organization. Most, um, well, there's some technical reasons you may apply it as well, to be fair. Like, for instance, if you're doing a merging mobile client, it kind of makes sense to use event sourcing, because merging is really easy and synchronization is really easy. But in general, it's only going to be in, like roughly equivalent to the places you'd start considering using domain-driven design. You're going to have to do analysis. You're going to start looking at UX and looking and talking with domain experts. It's not building your little sister's diary. It's not just slapping together some scaffolding over a crud database. And there's a huge number of systems where that's perfectly acceptable to do, to just go in and take Ruby on Rails, spend two weeks knock a system out. There are a huge number of systems that can be done with. Don't try to apply everything everywhere. Any other questions? No? Well, then I will thank you guys for having me out. I'm sorry I almost missed it, but at least I didn't. And thanks for having me.